Hello, Vol Nation. Welcome to another episode of Believe in Tennessee Football. I'm your host, as always, Kyler Kerbson. Today, we got a great one. Uh, have on Jimmy Himes. He's been covering Knoxville sports since 1985. Uh, very popular sports radio show in Knoxville. And, uh, you know, we talk about some of the coaching hires for UT football and maybe what's going wrong with UT basketball. So, going to be a great one. Uh, let's start the show. By the game. Snap. The kick is in the air. And the kick this time is no, sir, Reed. No, sir, Reed. Final score. Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. Loads up, fires long for the end zone. The pass is going to be caught by Tennessee. Tennessee wins! Caught it by Tennessee, Jawan Jennings. Jennings makes the catch in the end zone on the Hail Mary. Down to the 35, to the 40, to the 45, to the 50, to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. What did he do? All he did was score. Joey Pitt, touchdown on play number one. All right, so before we start the show, got to shout out our sponsor at betonline.ag. Uh, you know, now that football's over, um, people stop betting, but there's still college basketball, there's NBA, there's NHL, so there's plenty of stuff to be betting on. Um, I would uh, suggest not betting on Tennessee basketball on the weekends. Seem to do pretty bad on Saturdays, so maybe bet for the other teams. Win some money that way, uh, but Bet Online is a great place. They cover so much um, award shows, reality TV, and you know they have millions of props uh, on anything that you can imagine. Uh, they also have the online casino as well, so that's open twenty four hours. You can always get in on that. Uh, so head on over to their website or on your mobile device, uh, and you get a you know if you sign up today, you get fifty percent off a sign up sign up bonus. Uh, for betonline.ag. So, bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Okay, so I welcome on a special guest. He has been covering Knoxville sports since 1985, and uh, he's about to come on his 22nd anniversary of Sports Talk. It is Jimmy Himes. How are we doing, Jimmy? Kyle, we're doing great. Gosh, I remember um, we were just talking the first time I ever interviewed you. We were living in the same subdivision yeah. in Kensington, and you were committing to Tennessee. That was just a couple of years ago. Just a couple. <laughs> um, you had quite the one-up being in the same subdivision as the the biggest recruit in Knoxville. There we go. That, <laughs> that was the plan. I wasn't going to buy that house until I found out you were living there. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were just talking. I I – you know, first big interview was with you on my commitment was with you. Um, I came on your guys' show multiple, multiple times, always loved it. Um, talking with you and John and, you know, I appreciate you coming on. I feel like it's come full circle, you know, now that I'm trying to do this thing and I'm having you as a guest and, and, you know, let's find a little bit more about Jimmy. Let's figure out who, how he ticks and uh, what he thinks. Well, I look forward to it. Uh, I don't, this is one of the few times I think I've ever been interviewed by somebody that I used to cover. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would imagine so, but yeah. uh, I feel, I feel pretty blessed that I have the opportunity to pursue this path. Um, you know, never, never thought it would happen, but I, I'm really enjoying it. I, I, I'm really liking, um, you know, being able to interview guys and, and talk to them and, and just, research sports i mean that's that's what it all is it's just research and sports so um anything that i can stay in the realm of sports i really enjoy uh so let's get right into it now I, i'm living in nashville now i don't you know i'm not on the on the ground like you are in knoxville what is the theme i'm sure you have people calling into your show um telling you what they think what is the theme with the fans um everyone in knoxville with the new coaching uh, hires and Danny White and everything like that. I think there, there's a segment. I, I think there are some fans that, regardless of who you hire, they're excited. That's their guy. He's yeah. my coach, and I'm behind him. And by golly, we're going to win. Then you've got a growing segment 
that because of the history of Tennessee football since Philip Former was fired, one coach after another has not succeeded at the level they've wanted. So it's wait and see. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to wait and see. I'm not going to get invested because I've been hurt before because I've been too invested. <laughs> yeah. Then you got a you got a smaller group that's like, eh, this ain't going to work. They just hired somebody from Central Florida. He wasn't the first choice. He's not going to be able to win in the league. So th- that's to me, that's the smaller percentage. But there's a higher percentage to me from what I'm – the people I'm uh, talked to that think that it's it, – they've kind of got this wait-and-see approach. Yeah. But – and you do have some that go in with the blind loyalty. He's going to get it done. He's going to score points. Look what he did in Central Florida. And I, I do think he's going to come in here and score some points. I just don't know how many points other teams are going to score against Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is one concern. I know it was such a big grab or, or such a big deal to hire a good defensive coordinator and find that person, the right person for a position. And, you know, looking back over Tim Banks' career – and seeing what he's done, there's times where he struggled. I mean, when he first became a official, full fledged defensive coordinator, wasn't a co defensive coordinator. He struggled. He he got fired. He got replaced. Um, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that is a good hire? Do you think he can fit well, especially with the other coaches around him? Because I feel like Rodney Garner will possibly be a little help towards Tim Banks with all that experience he has. Well, I think uh, a couple of things about that. If you look at his resume, it doesn't jump out and scream success at Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, but I do think, to your point, I think a guy like Rodney Garner is a defensive line coach. Willie Martinez, who was on Tennessee staff, who you know well, mm-hmm. in the secondary. Those are guys that have coached in the SEC a long time. They know the lay of the land. They know what it takes to win in the league. They know what an SEC defensive player looks like. I think they can help, and I think a lot of the pre-planning going into a game and setting up your game plan is going to be very important as well. But I also think this. I think there were probably three reasons why Tennessee really struggled to hire a defensive coordinator, and one of the reasons is the NCAA cloud hanging over Tennessee. They're going to have sanctions. We don't know what they are yet. Yeah. The other thing is the roster has been depleted, so you're not – you're not going to inherit Henry Toho Toho and some of these other guys that are pretty good football players. The third thing is Josh Heupel's offense at this, this fast pace, they averaged 86 plays per game at central Florida. How many plays per game did Tennessee average on offense? 66. When you run 86 plays a game on offense, your defense is going to be running a lot of plays too. Yes. So it's not an offense that protects the defense. So I think those were three reasons Tennessee had trouble hiring a defensive coordinator. And having said all that, I do think the experience of Martinez, the experience of Garner, and they still have another coach to hire. But I, I think those two guys can go a long way in helping Banks as a defensive coordinator. Yeah, and, and you know, what you're saying, that the struggles of hiring a defensive coordinator, you know, what they're up against. I think they, that Tennessee has been up against a lot. Uh, with hiring everyone. I mean, hiring Danny White, you're up against a lot. Hiring a head coach, you were up against a lot. It it seems like people still think this is a home run job. This is a job that um, can you can be at forever. It will be the best you've ever experienced. And I feel like you got to look in the mirror a little bit and say, not right now. You know, maybe in 2005 it was, but – not right now. This is a this is a totally different animal. Would you agree? Absolutely. In fact, uh, and I've had some discussions, debates, arguments with Tennessee fans about where the job stands right now. Look, in the 1990s, when Philip Fulmer had it going, when Tennessee was winning more games than anybody in the country except for Florida, Florida State, Nebraska, this was easily a top ten job. Easily. Yeah. Well, you have you've had eight losing seasons in 13 years. You haven't won the SEC since 98. You've been to the SEC title game three times. The shine has come off of the Tennessee <laughs> brand. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. So, so right now, right now, because of the NCAA sanctions and because the programs had a difficulty in terms of, of producing winning teams, I'm not sure it's a top 25 job right now. And I can't believe this, but I heard some people arguing this. Is Central Florida a better job than Tennessee? I'm like, are you kidding me? Three years ago, you'd be laughed out of town if you, somebody brought that up. Yeah. 10 or 15 years ago. 
Now, if you wanted to argue about Central Florida, you would say less pressure. Uh, you don't have to play Alabama, Florida, and Georgia every year. So yeah. you're going to win more football games. And, and, and those would be, and you're probably over the next three or four years going to have more quote success because of the level of competition. Yeah. Uh, at Tennessee, uh, you've got, you're going to get paid more. You got a seat at the SEC table. You're going to have, you got a greater tradition. You got better facilities. Those would be the, the reasons you would take Tennessee. I mean, Tennessee overall is a better job right now, today in late February, you debate whether it's, it's a better job. For several reasons. I mean, that's obviously Josh Heupel thought it was a better job. He wouldn't have left Central Florida. Yeah. But, but it's not as good a job. But, kind of, I'm going to tell you, in my opinion, it, it won't take that long, I don't think, to get it back. You just have to get the right coach. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, so, I grew up at LSU, and I covered LSU for a number of years before yep. I moved to Knoxville. LSU had, had eight losing seasons in 11 years. They couldn't get it right. That's hard to imagine right now, isn't it? Yeah. Until they hired Nick Saban. And he flipped it around, and LSU's been outstanding for the most part ever since then. Uh, Alabama hired a, a bunch of guys named Mike, and they were screwing around with Mike Dubos and Mike Price and, and Mike Shula. And they had their lulls, and then they hired Saban, he turned around. The point is you get the right guy in there and get this thing turned back around, it's going to be fine. The one thing that, that I think Tennessee has missed out on a great deal, and you can probably relate a little bit to this, right now – in my opinion, in the state of Tennessee, it has never been better at consistently producing really good high school players. Yeah. The top 15 players in the state last year all went to Power 5 schools. You know how many Tennessee got? I think it was two. Yeah. You have, they got to capitalize on that. It, it, it's, when you look at the, the growth in the mid-state, the Nashville area, there's so many players there. You still have players in Memphis. There are more good players coming out of East Tennessee. Tennessee has to capitalize on that. If you get the 10 or 12 best players in this state and then supplement it with players from Georgia, Alabama, Florida, the Carolinas, Louisiana, you can have a great recruiting class. But you can your basis here is better than it's ever been. Now Tennessee needs to take advantage of that. Yeah, it's so different nowadays with recruiting. A lot of times when guys grow up in that state, they grow up in that city, they are that team's fan. Mm -hmm. But kids are are – flashes you know that they, they, they see something glittery they see something shiny and it's oh I like that I mean I remember you know being in high school and uh you know not I wasn't the football player I am you know got to and you know there was younger kids 10 11 year olds that their favorite team was Oregon because Oregon had nice cool uniforms yeah. you know those those teenagers, those little 10 year olds grew up and now it's like Oregon was my favorite team growing up and I lived in Tennessee, but it was because they were cool at the time It's because they were winning at the time. So I think it's even more nowadays where just because you grew up in that state, just because you are from that city, wherever that school is, that doesn't mean you're a fan of them. That doesn't mean that you want to necessarily go there and schools have to realize that. I mean, I think Tennessee, there was even a moment they took my recruiting for granted because I was from Knoxville. I was a Tennessee fan growing up. I mean, I had Tennessee posters in my room. So it's like, obviously this guy's going to come here, but I had to be like, Hey, I, you know, I appreciate some, some calls and texts every now and then you don't show me some love. Yeah. Show yeah. me a little bit of love. Like, <laughs> yeah, I get, I get what you're saying, but, uh, but uh, I, I think it's, it's such a huge thing now being able to lock down the state. And I think some of the hires that we've had with, you know, Glenn Ellerby, obviously, he's coming from UCF. He's been with Coach Heupel for a while, but mm -hmm. he played at MTSU. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he coached there, so he has a little national connection. Um, and then you have, uh, who is it, Max, uh, our, um, the running back coach. He's, yeah, he's Jerry from, Mack. Yeah, Jerry from Mack. Memphis. Yeah, he's from Memphis. Memphis. So mm -hmm. it's like you're you're grabbing the big, the big cities to try and hone everything in. Mm-hmm. Well, and here's the thing, too. So Tennessee should never lose T. Martin's son to Clemson. Yeah. Tennessee <laughs> should never lose T. Higgins from Oak Ridge to Clemson. Yeah. And Trevor Lawrence grew up a Tennessee fan, as you know. And then Tennessee screwed up his recruitment. They brought in another quarterback on the same visit, and they showed that quarterback more attention than they showed Trevor Lawrence. How different does Tennessee's program look if for the last three years, or going back four years, yeah, Trevor Lawrence, Amari Rogers, and T. Higgins. Yeah. <laughs> Three guys. 
so that's where that's where Tennessee's kind of messed up, and and so they got to get that back. They got to get that back to getting the best players. And and now and I'm, I mentioned the mid state having all these really good players, and, and and a lot of that I think is a result of the Tennessee Titans. I think having NFL football there has made football more important in the state, yeah. filtering down to middle school and high school. Mm-hmm. But a lot of those really good players are sons of coaches or sons of former players. And their allegiance not necessarily is to ten- the state of Tennessee. They might be from Florida or, or Michigan or somewhere else. That's true. And so you do have to recruit them. You got to get after it and, and make sure that you show them the love and, and that you uh, that you can show the vision that Tennessee can get back to where it was. I do think they will. Uh, when it's going to happen, I don't know. But I, there, there's just too much tradition and and too too many positive things at the University of Tennessee for it not to get this football program turned around. I agree. I agree. Now, I, I do want to ask, you know, you're one of the best at researching, at figuring out things, at breaking the news in Knoxville. Um, do you think Danny was a little overwhelmed when he came in uh, and had to do a coaching search, didn't realize what Vol Twitter was um, and what the masses can do with a, just a little bit of information? Culture shock. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, when he, he was like, I've never had a leak in my entire career. I was like, well, you've never been at Tennessee. Yeah, who, Buffalo, who cared? Central Florida, <laughs> they care a little bit more, but not enough. No. Uh, and and see, here's the thing, too. And he, he believes that a lot of his leaks are coming internally. Uh, I'll just tell you this. A lot of the stories that I break are not because I got it from somebody internally. No. It's from maybe somebody internally talking to somebody who talked to somebody that I know. Yeah. And, and you you build those connections and trying to find things out. So so rarely do I call a Tennessee employee and they say, hey, here it is. Uh, I I backdoor it. Yes. And so you, so you cannot hopefully trace it. And but a lot of it's not leaks coming from. And here's the thing, too. If you call a coach, let's say you just call a coach at um, uh, at uh, Clemson and you offered him a job. Well, what's he going to do? Well, he's going to start calling other coaches. Well, what do you think? Should I take this job? You coach at Tennessee. What do you think about it? What's the potential there? What, what's the, what are the facilities like? What's the fan? So then that coach tells somebody else. And so in the coaching fraternity, it gets around. Yeah. So that's, that's how a lot of these leaks occur, not just from within. And when they happen, don't worry about that. You can't get too thin skinned. And, and I actually think a guy that you played for, Butch Jones, got too thin skinned about the media, about criticism, about several things. Yeah. And I think, I think it in part, it led a little bit to his undoing. Yeah. Uh, I think he's, he focused too much on the external stuff. You always hear control the controllables. I think he tried to control the uncontrollables at times. Mm-hmm. And so, it, but, but now in Butch Jones's defense, and I've had this argument with people before, if you look at the last 13 years at Tennessee, there's one coach that had two nine-win seasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's Butch exactly. Jones. Yeah. So all this stuff about what a failure he was, I, I, no, I don't buy that. Did the program get away from him at the end? It did. But I think that he developed what I would call rabbit ears a little bit. And mm-hmm. I, and, I, and, and, and Danny White needs to stay away from that. Don't yeah. take on the fans. Don't say to the fans, hey, you're failing. No, that, that's, that's not the right approach here. And I think he'll learn that. Uh, and I think you, you focus on what you can do and not worry about the, the criticism out there. Yeah, I completely agree. I think one of the things, too – that happened with, with coach Jones is there was a lot of change that he made that I don't necessarily agree with. And I think it was almost this pressure of, well, now that I'm in the sec, it has to be this way, you know, and now that I'm in the sec, I have to have this person on staff and he got rid of a lot of guys. He gr- literally grew with, like he became a good head coach with these guys and got rid of a lot of them. Uh, brought in you know new people and I think doing that really affected everything I I, you know I don't I don't think it was um, the same family unit that it was before and you know uh, luckily we'll see how Heupel does but uh, you know if the next two years don't go as planned I can say I was part of the best team in the last 15 years so uh, I'm excited about being able to say that point um, there are a lot of people that hope you won't be able to say that. Yeah, <laughs> but, I know. <laughs> but, I, 
I, I am on the fence because I don't want to be able to say that, but I also do. Um, but, you know, who knows? Hopefully, Hypo can turn it around and, uh, you know, be able to bring success again back to Tennessee and the way it's supposed to be. Um, speaking of. I will of- say this I, I don't think Hypo, he's more low key, and, and I don't think he's affected by the external noise that's out there. Yeah. I think that'll, that'll be positive for him. I don't think – and he's been at Oklahoma. He's, he knows about the outside noise. So, I, I don't think that's going to bother him too much. I just think the whole key – and I do believe he's going to score some points. I think he's a very good offensive mind. He's a smart guy. He's a good guy. Oh, yeah. they, will, they will score a lot more points than they've been scoring. But the whole key is the ability on defense. And, and my judgment on defense, it's, it's no longer how many points did you give up or how many yards did you give up. All those stats nowadays with football – my deal is, did you win the game, and did your defense make a stop when it needed to make a stop? Yeah, just need one. If you one. do those two things. Need one. Yeah. Just need one with, with these high-powered offenses. I mean, you know, last year's SEC championship was a 42 to – or 52 to 46 game. Like, it's scoring. That's all it is nowadays. It's, even in the SEC, and, you know, it was a few years ago that it was 9 to 6 LSU versus Alabama. You know, and it's just switched yeah. around completely. Um, and, I, you know, people loved Lane Kiffin last year, and all they did was score. They played no defense, yeah. and it was fun to watch. And people, you know, are on that Kiffin train over in Ole Miss. So, I mean, I think it can be the same thing. You, ju- you just need that one stop out of the defense. And if they can just create turnovers, you're going to be fine. Create one to two turnovers every game. You know, give you can give up a bunch of yards, give us some touchdowns, but if you create turnovers, maybe give us a short field once or twice, that's game's over with a high-powered if, offense. If you're hypo, one of your goals is to make Nick Saban say he stole our signals. If you <laughs> say that, then that means you're scoring points. You're running up and down the field. And I don't know that Ole Miss has been more popular than after a 15-point loss, whatever it was, was 63 to 48 or something crazy like that. Yeah. And Ole Miss got a lot of love for that because yeah. they hung with them, scored a lot of points, and and had the head coach at Alabama screaming, you're stealing my signal. So yeah. uh, you, if you're going to get beat, you'd rather get beat like that than 34 to 3. Yes, completely so, agree. At least if you're scoring some points, you got something to cheer about. So sorry to interrupt. We will get right back to the show, but want to shout out another one of our sponsors, uh, eBay. Um, So eBay is the best place to buy and sell sneakers. Uh, They have rare vintage stuff uh, that you can find, uh, so many different options, and they're the original sneaker marketplace. So if anywhere to buy sneakers, they're going to be the ones. Uh, they have an authenticity guarantee on all their sneakers. Um, you know, meticulously inspected by authenticators. Uh, you know, experienced authenticators that you know verify the box, the logo, the stitching. It, so many different things. Uh, you also get an authenticity guarantee tag um, that includes a digital stamp, so you know it's real. Uh, and it also protects sellers of sneakers uh, with a verified return process. And for you know the sneaker sellers out there, you know eBay has eliminated selling fees on sneakers a hundred dollars or more. So it, it's literally the best place to flip and sell sneakers. Uh, so go to eBay.com/sneakers today and uh, sign up, man. Start buy and start selling um ebay it's the world's best destination for discovering great value and unique selection yes yes so we're on the rise we're going we're going up okay so on in the hype house on the hype train everything like that um let's switch over to basketball now obviously i do not have the expertise that i do in football with basketball i'm just kind of watching. I mean, I played rec league in high school, didn't even play for my high school team. So when I'm watching the games and trying to understand what's going on, why why are we up and down and up and down when we play these teams? How can we whoop up on Kentucky and then lose to Kentucky? What do you think it is? What's what's wrong with these? Like what's going on with these inconsistencies? 
I think there are a couple of things that work here. Number one, and, and I was wrong about this in projecting Tennessee, I thought they would be fine with point guard by committee. Yeah. And they're not. They don't have a true point guard. I thought with Vescovi, Josiah Jordan James, uh, Keon Johnson, I thought could play some point. Jaden Spring could play some point. Uh, Victor Bailey was, according to one of the players, the best kept secret in college basketball. I thought that mixture would lead to being fine at the point guard position. In truth, I don't think any of them are really true point guards. They're they're all of them are two guards. They're shooting yeah. guards, and and I think that's hurt them a little bit. Here's the other thing too: the, the seniors inside, John Folkers and E. Pons, neither one of them have had uh, really good years. Pons has been battling a recent injury. I thought they would combine to score 12 to 15 points per game each. Well, they're not there. They're not even close to that. Uh, I did hear something Rick Barnes said the other day that I thought was very intriguing. He said there is such a thing as COVID fatigue. And he said it has affected a lot of college basketball players this year. And I'm thinking he's talking about some of his own players. Yeah. Right? He wouldn't bring that up. No. Well, Eve Pons has acknowledged that he had COVID. And I wonder a little bit if, if there's some lingering effects with him yeah. with COVID fatigue. There, there's some people that have COVID and they're still affected 90 days later. They still haven't regained their sense of smell or taste. Yeah. It affects different people in different ways. I don't know that John Fulkerson's ever had COVID, but he's not playing like he did a year ago. Last 10 games last year, Kyler he averaged 18.3 points. He scored 27 at Kentucky. He looked like the, he was a first-team All-SEC player. Yeah. This year, no. Now, I don't know all the reasons for it. I don't know if it's COVID. I don't know if just um, just confidence issues, period, which, which came first, a loss of confidence or, or, you know, was it COVID, whatever's going on. I think the lack of consistent inside scoring is affecting them. The lack of the consistent point guard play is affecting them. Uh, and then, uh, I, for whatever reason, I know this team defensively is ranked among the best in the country, but when I watch him play, I don't think I'm watching one of the best defensive teams in the country. Yeah. I see, I see Kentucky shoot over 60% in the first half and nailed three pointers against them. Um, I, see, I, I saw South Carolina hit seven of 11 on threes in one half against them. I've seen too many teams drive to the basket and either score or get fouled. And so defensively, I don't think there's, as good as I projected them to be for whatever reason. I'm not sure this team has the right chemistry that it needs, mm -hmm. which is one reason I'm concerned that when it comes to postseason or the NCAA tournament, I don't really see this team making a, a long run. Do they have the potential? Yes. Uh, did Conzo Martin's team make a long run a few years ago? They did. Yeah. But you know what? If you look at the history of Tennessee basketball, that's one of only two situations where Tennessee made a surprisingly good run. All the other times, or most of the other times, they've made a disappointing exit. Yes. And, and if this team doesn't find the consistency that it's liked all year, they go, may go one and one in the NCAA tournament and they're going home. Uh, potentially, they could make a long run. But mm. because they have not shown that yet, I, I don't see this team making a significant run in the NCAA tournament right now. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, like you said, with the with the play that they're showing on the court, it doesn't. It really doesn't look like they are connected in any way. And I, I would say that would have to go down to just leadership. Just from Fulkerson and Pons, you don't even have to be the guy that produces the most, the guy that has the most points, the most assists, the most rebounds. You know, you don't have to blow out the stat sheet to be a leader. Um, and I feel like a lot of guys in basketball get caught up in that where it's, well, you're not playing well. You're, you're, you don't score the most. Um, you know, our freshmen score the most. So they're going to be the leader, not Fulkerson. But, hey, you need to step up and start saying something and just, you know, play your butt off. That's, that's all that matters. You know, putting out effort can put you into a leadership role, and I think it's something that we need when we are getting close in those games to be able to finish them or, or be able to continue the gap. Because, I mean, we were killing Vanderbilt for, you know, two and a half quarter or, you know, a half of basketball. And then all of a sudden they got close. All of a sudden it was a four point game. So it's like, why is that happening? What, well, how about we lead the troops a little bit better and make sure that Vanderbilt doesn't come back and make it such a close game. 
Yeah, and and they they went through one of these falls. They had they had seventeen turnovers, something like that. This team shouldn't have seventeen turnovers. They've got too many players on the team that should be better ball handlers than that. But Keon Johnson struggled a lot, and look, I think he's a terrific athlete. Does a lot of great things on the court, but his ball handling and his turnovers have been a concern. He had six of them against Vanderbilt. That's way too many. Yeah. Uh, I almost thought he was trying too hard last night. He's he's from. Uh, Shelbyville, he's from the area, and I just wondered if he was like, I'm going to show out in this game, and and maybe it, it backfired on him a little bit, maybe put too much pressure on himself. But to your point, I think, I think Tennessee led by about 15 points maybe. Yeah. And Vandy cut it to four yeah. uh, in the last few minutes, and you're sitting there thinking, are they going to let this game get away before Tennessee went on a 10-0 run to, to pull it out? But the inability to stop an opponent's run. Kentucky had a 15 nothing run on them. Vanderbilt had a, a run on them. To me, that gets down to a lot of leadership on the court. One of the assistant coaches the other day said that Josiah Jordan-James is undoubtedly the leader of this team. That surprised me. I didn't view him that way. And then he missed the next couple of games because of a wrist injury. So he's not even on the court. Yeah. Um, John Fulkerson is more of a leader by example. Pons is probably the same way. Uh, They don't have that in-your-face Grant Williams or in-your-face Admiral Schofield kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And I think they have missed that. I also think they've missed a guy like Jordan Bone, who yeah. was such a good point guard, uh, who could take control. And if they needed a basket, he could drive it in and score or dish. Uh, I, they missed that out, out of the point guard's position. And basketball in particular in the postseason is a guard's game, and it's typically a point guard's game. And I think Tennessee's lacking at that. Now, I think next year when they get in Kennedy Chandler, that can make a huge difference. But right now they don't have that. And yeah. that's why it's hard for me – to see them snapping out of this inconsistency that they have shown over the last few months. Yeah. Do you, I mean, with, with what's going on, the inconsistency that they've shown, do you, do you feel like there's even more pressure on Barnes or, or even hot seat talk about Barnes just because of the potential that we had going into this season, the potential we had with Grant and Amari when they were here, do you feel like there could be hot seat talks with him? I, I, I wouldn't go so far as hot seat talk, but I would go to say disappointing. Yeah. And we've had more and more people say, this guy's making $5 million a year, and they've lost six SEC games. He's making $5 million a year, and they're losing to this team or that team. They're inconsistent. So a lot of people are starting to point more at him about all this talent that he has and why are they not succeeding more? Look, this team, there's no way they should have six losses in the yeah. SEC. They just shouldn't. They're better than that. I don't know what team in the league is more talented than Tennessee. Now, yeah. I don't know that Alabama's more talented, but Alabama's got a significant lead. They're going to win the SEC. I don't know that Kentucky's more talented. They've got some good players, but I don't know if they're better than what Tennessee's got. So I, I, this team is underachieved. It, it is yeah. underachieved. Now, you can change the narrative. If you finish the season really well, make a, win the SEC tournament, make some noise in the NCAA tournament, all that narrative changes. But there are people now pointing more of a finger at Rick Barnes about why this team to date has underachieved. Yeah, and, and I think that was something even when he was hired that people were concerned about at Texas. He had good runs. He had good teams, but he never won. He never won the big one. He got to the tournament a lot of times, but they – you know, they lost in the tournament. And I think that was even a concern like, well, can this guy finish like he's supposed Mm to? Um, And now it's kind of rearing its ugly head again is uh, can he finish? Can he be able to put a team completely together to win a national championship? He he got to one final for Texas. And there were, there were, the thought was he had more talent and should have made more Uh, last night. And I noticed it more last night than I've had, than I have in, in previous games. I saw a lot of times when a player made a mistake, he jerked him out. Yeah. Deion Johnson throws it away, he comes out. Vescovi makes a bad pass, he comes out. Fulkerson, turnover, he comes out. I'm not a Hall of Fame basketball coach, okay? So let's make that clear. <laughs> but I did play a lot of sports, and I'm not so sure I would be real comfortable with every mistake I made, I'm going to get pulled out of a game. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's the best approach. Yeah. And I, I've seen that a little bit more often. I mean, if you, if you were a Tennessee and offensive lineman and you had an illegal procedure 
and they jerk you out of the game. Okay. You there's but your mindset is probably I just had a penalty. By golly, I'm ready to crush somebody. But yeah. well, I, I would not respond well to being taken out if I made a mistake when I played football or baseball or basketball. I play tennis now. If I double fault and the guy says, Oh, you're out of here, we're gonna put somebody else in to, to serve and you're I'm gonna bench you. Um, I think that you can create some doubt among your players and cost them a little bit of confidence if you have that quick of a hook. Mm-hmm. Just my opinion, but I, I saw it more last night than I've seen it in previous games. Maybe yeah. that's the impatience of Barnes toward the players. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree with that. I think there's a certain time and place to – I don't want to say punish, but it is punish a guy for bad play. Um, and I don't think it's right then – in the game because you just take him out of the flow. He doesn't have a chance to react. He doesn't have a chance to grow in that moment and to say, Oh, I messed up. Now, what am I going to do now? What am I going to, how am I going to react? How am I going to respond? And if he never gets that opportunity to respond, then he's, he's never going to become a better player. So I do think that's something to look out for something that you can really miss in a developmental standpoint. Um, when it comes to players. So um, so before I let you go, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, your past. You've been here since 1985, been covering Knoxville sports. Was there a story or a time in Knoxville where it was just bananas? It was crazy. I'm sure, you know, the fact that you came in when, you know, Sugar Vols was happening was, was pretty big. Um, and then, with these coaching searches and, and what we just went through and over the past 15 years, do you think one is bigger than the other? Do you think one was more entertaining than the other? Um, and your, your take on the differences between them. Gosh, there've been, there've been so many. Uh, so if I think of more recent vintage, the John Curry coaching search, which became a circus that led to him getting fired, the former being hired, that was a part of it. A few years before that, there was the uh, groomers, John Gruden. Yeah. Um, I guess I can say this now because he's in the NFL. Uh, I'll just put it this way. I, I have John Gruden's cell phone, and he we communicated. Okay. So that's why all that time I kept saying he's not coming here. Yeah. That was one of the reasons. And others were like, you're crazy. You don't know. Somebody you know very well called me and chewed me out and said, I thought you were in better touch with John Gruden. He's coming here. He's, his family's going to Catholic and all this. And I said, uh, Ray, that's not right. And, he, <laughs> and, and so, but that was one of them. That was a crazy time. Uh, the John Major situation, when he got fired and, and Coach Fulmer was hired, that was bizarre because, as you know, Majors was a legend yep. and he had had a pretty good string of success at the yeah. time that they decided to fire him. He had the heart attack, uh, he had a contract on his desk. He shows up to work unannounced. They, they pull the contract. Former goes 3-0 and and beats uh, two really good teams, uh, Florida and Georgia. And so they oust majors. That was huge. That was huge. Uh, the Sugar Vols that you mentioned uh, was, was a big story. Uh, I remember the very first game I covered uh, at Tennessee. They're playing UCLA, and Tennessee has a 26-10 to lead with five minutes left in the game. It's over, right? And UCLA had a running back named Gaston Green that scored two touchdowns, two two-point conversions, and, it, and it, it was a tie. The game ended up a tie. And I thought, this team's going to be a lot of fun. They're going to score some points, <laughs> give them up, no telling what's going to happen. And that's the team that, that um, after an open day, came back and beat number one-ranked Auburn and Bo Jackson, just drilled them, yeah. Tony Robinson. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, but there have been a lot of great moments uh, in covering Tennessee. There, I was on the front end of this, uh, the phone fraud. I don't know if you remember that case, but all these Tennessee players – got an unauthorized uh, uh, long-distance phone number from a person that worked at the Thornton Center who was a tutor. Uh-huh. And then these players started calling their families all over the place. And then one of them decided it would be a good idea to call a sex line in Europe. So, And, and we had all these phone numbers, and, and so we started calling them to oh, find gosh. out where they were. And then I tracked down one guy, and I said – it, it was a Tennessee player and I'll not call his name, but I said, um, I said, look, these phone numbers are coming out of here. And I said, he said, well, I didn't make those phone calls. I said, well, they came out of your room. Well, I didn't make them. I said, well, then who was your roommate? I don't remember. 
<laughs> you don't remember, huh? Okay. So that was, that was a weird time. That was in the mid-90s when that phone fraud episode came up. But there have been a lot of uh, crazy moments, fun moments. It's been a great journey for me to be here uh, for these, uh, gosh, 36 years now of uh, yeah. covering Tennessee sports. And and um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. Well, I'm glad. I, I'm glad that you were part of it. I'm glad that you were here. I'm, I'm so happy that, you know, I was part of your covering of the sports. Um, and I feel like people a lot of times give media, you know, a bad look. Yeah, they, they, they don't quite understand what's going on with them. But I think my idea of the media switched when I was at UT, when I was going into my last year, and thought of you guys as really something that could help me. If I went to every interview that I possibly could, did every single thing that I possibly could, was just real and just talked about what I felt and, and what was going on in the locker room and out in the practice field, it, it was a positive thing. You know, people were yeah. going to see me for who I was. And, and uh, it, it, it literally helped me be a more popular player. It helped people know who I was. It helped mm -hmm. honestly in, you know, my NFL days, just like having a name out there. It's probably the reason why I got some all sec honors is just because I was out there. It was, you know, probably the reason I, you know, got some offensive lineman of the week is because he was a good guy. He's a good, he's a good player, but he's also a good guy. So I think the media can be used to your advantage if you're, if you're honest and upfront about it. Well, you figured it out. And look, not everybody in the media does it the right way or is a good guy. Not every football player is a good guy that does it the right way. Not every coach is a good guy that does it the right way. Yeah. But there are a whole lot of them, a greater number that are good people and they do it the right way. Uh, I once had a coach that said, I want my players to use you. You don't use them. And I'm like, well, why do we have to use each other? Why don't we just get along? You know, <laughs> why don't we just be honest and fair? And you have to understand that I have a job to do. If there are players that get in trouble, I have to report it. But if you go out and beat Alabama, then I'm going to report that too. Yes. You're going to like some of the stuff. You're going to maybe not dislike some. But as long as you, when we walk away, if you say that you thought I was fair and honest in covering you, that's all I want. That's all I want. So, And we can have a professional relationship doing that. Now, have I ever crossed the line to become friends with some people? I've I have. It's kind of hard not to. Yeah. But there has to be the understanding that uh, if – and this kind of happened with a basketball coach that is now at Auburn. We got along great, but you get in trouble, I have to report this. Okay. Sorry. I can't just – you know, and, and that, that speaks to your integrity and, and just doing your job. And uh, it took a while, but he understood that. And so we, we still get along. But – there are going to be bumps along the way from an athlete and a coach to the media. It, it's going to happen. But if you're fair and you're honest and try to see both ends of that spectrum, try to put yourself in their shoes. You know, I'm not perfect. People I cover are not perfect, but just be fair and honest. And I, and I think you can always have a good relationship. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I really appreciate you coming on, Jimmy. Um, this is definitely going to help numbers because <laughs> you're a legend in Knoxville. <laughs> well, so, uh, I very much appreciate it. And, and like I said, I, I, you know, love the fact that I was able to have you there through my recruitment, through my time at Tennessee and, you know, just enjoy being on your show um, and, and being a part of the media landscape that is, <laughs> that is Tennessee football. So uh, well, thank you so much always, for coming on. You're welcome. You're always a class guy. Hey, we'll always have Kensington, right? That's right. Yes, we will always have Kensington. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming on. All right. Thank you guys so much uh, for listening. Please rate and subscribe. Um, you know, let all your family and friends know. Uh, tell them about the podcast. Uh, you know, I'm going to start going on YouTube, so hopefully that'll get some more people Uh into the game and you know follow me on social media at kyler curbison on twitter facebook instagram um and as always go balls <laughs>